eight lands. Lands data sets. And you don't have to send me the data sets, but just send me an index pointer to these things. Okay. So also uh, homework five. I think a couple of people asked. So last class I mentioned that. Uh, you don't have to submit on on Monday. You can submit on Wednesday. So I will change it on Canvas. Uh, so, okay, actually, can you change it on Canvas? Yeah. The submission time. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So you should do that. So, so it's due next Wednesday, not Monday. Just as a Thanksgiving follow-up. Okay. So and homework six. Uh, I was supposed to put it up on Friday, but uh, because of all the project meetings, I couldn't do anything else. So I will do it. Uh, I mean, I've started writing the questions, so it should be done today or tomorrow. So it should be tomorrow, and uh, you, this will be due. Uh, early December. Questions on uh, announcements? Oh, the other thing I promised that I would announce is that the project due date. Uh, many of you said that uh, the day of the final is probably not a great day to submit the project, so you can submit the Friday of the final. Okay, so it's uh, Friday, I think it's December. Okay, so this is uh, something you might want to note. Okay, so any questions on this? Okay. Okay. Alright, so, okay, so last time we started looking at this general, uh, last few classes we've been looking at optimization formulations of problems, and last time we introduced this, or we started studying this notion of a relaxation. Okay, so we said that uh, you, I mean, you have a problem, uh, usually it's a combinatorial problem, and you come up with an integer program formulation of this, okay, where uh, you introduce some variable 0, 1, you cast it as an optimization problem. Then we said that optimization problems with 0, 1 variables are often NP hard. So what you do is you relax these constraints to something, uh, a simplest example was variables in 0, 1. And uh, once, you make, once you move to this relaxation, it turns out things are easy. Okay, so uh, pretty often. At least if you have linear constraints, they are always easy. This is what we call linear programming. And uh, then we said that, okay, so this is now a proxy for the original optimization problem that we wanted to solve. And, uh, and and the hope was maybe if I solve this, it, it can help me move to a solution to the original problem. Okay, and this is what uh, we call this relax and drawn paradigm. Okay, so I'll see, I'll expel it out more detail in a slide or so. Yeah. So formally speaking, what it was was the following: you write an integer program for the problem, and uh, you relax to get a linear or convex program. Okay, but and this just means change integer constraints to some interval constraints. We'll see a bit more sophisticated example today. Okay, so, but what we've seen so far is stuff like this. Then you solve this relaxed program to get a possibly fractional solution. And, uh, and then you round this, and this is what we saw last time. So we saw it last time in the example of vertex cover. So we said that uh, if you round everything that's more than, all these fractional values that are more than half to one, and uh, stuff that are less than half to zero, then uh, all the constraints are satisfied. And uh, you still get a solution whose cost is not much different from the original. So, 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 so that's called the rounding step. And uh, yeah, so, so this was the problem. You had a graph. You're going to pick a small subset of vertices. 
such that for every edge, at least one of its endpoints is picked. And uh, you could write a linear program for this problem, where you basically said you want to minimize sum over all u x u. x u is supposed to denote if vertex u is picked or not. Then you say that for all edges, i j, uh, x i plus x j is bigger than or equal to 1. So at least one of its endpoints is picked. And, uh, and of course, uh, 0 less than or equal to x u less than or equal to 1. So, the, so this was, so this as, uh, as I stated it is just a, a collection of hyperplanes, right? So a collection of half spaces, these are the constraints. And uh, I want to minimize a linear function over this intersection of half spaces. Okay, and this we said is a linear programming problem, you can solve it efficiently. And the x u's that you get could be fractional. We said that to go from a fractional solution to an integer one, all you've got to do in this case is round all the x u less than half to zero and others to one. And there was a very simple argument that said that this will not violate any constraints. Because if x i plus x j was bigger than or equal to 1, then at least one of them should be at least half. And therefore, uh, the, in the new solution, uh, these constraints will be satisfied. Yeah, and it's trivial to check that uh, the sum of x u is not doubled in this case. Yeah, and we said that the, using this, you get a factor 2 approximation for, for vertex curve. Okay, so this is what we saw last time. And we started looking at this other problem, which is called the set cover problem. So th this is kind of a generalization of vertex cover. And here, uh, the way, one way to think about it is, you have a bunch of topics, and uh, I forget if we call the topics M or this one M. So let's assume you have uh, N topics, and uh, you have M people. So each person has a subset of these topics that he's an expert in. And uh, you want to pick the smallest uh, collection of people so that for every topic you have at least one expert. And uh, yeah, so, so any questions about the problem? So this, we defined it last time. We also wrote a, a linear program for this. So. Okay, so what are the variables that we had picked? <coughs> so what do we want to choose, right? We want to choose a subset of the, uh, of the people. So what should our variables be? So that's, uh, those are the variables x, u. And now, uh, what are the constraints, right? And of course, our objective is to minimize the number of people, total number of people you choose. So it's to minimize sum over u x, u. And what are the constraints? So what are the constraints in the problem itself, right? Yeah, so for every topic, we must have chosen at least one expert. Right? So we said that uh, for topic i, let's denote by gamma of i the set of all experts on that subset of, yeah, set of all experts on that.
So, so that was gamma of i. And uh, the constraint was basically that. Sorry? Summation of x all the groups belong to that gamma Yeah, so for every i, we have sum over u in gamma of i, x u, is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay. So this was, so this is the linear program, and of course, uh, 0 is less than or equal to x u, less than or equal to 1. So in an integer program, you would just have had x u in uh, is actually 0 or 1. But we can't solve it to program sufficiently, so you replace that with this constraint. So that's, uh, so that's this. All right. And uh, we said last time that uh, the integer program captures the problem exactly. Therefore, if you change that constraint to this, what happens to the value of the of the optimum? Is the value of the relaxation smaller or larger than the value of the optimum? Uh, than just the optimum value for this problem? Is the question? So, how are these two related? Which is bigger than, than the other? Yeah, so this is a minimization problem, right? So if I minimize over a bigger set, then my minimum is going to be smaller. Right? Yeah, so, for this reason, the left is, uh, uh, the right is smaller than or equal to the left. Because the right side is essentially minimizing over all even fractional solutions for x use. Okay, while the left is only minimizing over the integer solutions. Yes, for this reason, uh, that is smaller than I do this. Alright. And, uh, right, so the idea behind this whole relax and run paradigm is that you want to now start with some fractional solution. So the optimal fractional solution to this and come up with a feasible solution that's not much larger than that. Okay, so that was our goal even last time. All right, so let's, let's try to do that. And I said that this time, what we, the way we went around is, uh, it's a little bit different. So you, uh, right, so the last time we basically rounded in a naive way, right? We said that uh, everybody who is more than half could be rounded up to one. And that was a feasible solution last time. Okay, so if you try that now, you, you'll realize that it's no longer a feasible solution because you could have uh, some topic i and uh, you have three experts. And uh, this guy has uh, x value equals one third. This one has x value equals one third. One third. Now the sum of all three is, is at least one. So, so this is a feasible, so this constraint is satisfying. But if you round only things that are bigger than half, then uh, then you have a problem. And this three need not be three; it could be anything big, right? So that's why so that's why this is difficult. So I mean, I'm just saying why that earlier rounding will not work. I see many confused faces. So ask a question. Explain the true optimal, the true integer optimal solutions greater than or equal to optimal solution value. Yeah, so, uh, so basically, the so what is the true integer of, right? So it's basically the the I mean, it's the answer to this to the actual problem. 
Okay, so it's the minimum number of people you've got to select so that everybody has it. Okay. We said that if if I had these uh, these constraints and I had x u belonging to zero or one, this optimization formulation, those two plus that, exactly captures the problem that we want. Okay, so. So right, so, so this thing is exactly the, the problem that we want, and that is the true integer opt. The relaxation is something where is an optimization problem where we replace this constraint with this one. Okay, so every solution to that is also a solution to this, because x u is now only uh, required to be in the interval zero or one. So now you have more feasible solutions, potentially many more feasible solutions. And you are solving a minimization problem over those guys. So that's why the minimum will only be smaller than or equal to the minimum uh, when you restrict to only zero or one. So, yeah. So that's the reason this is smaller than this. Like and next, what we want to do is now say that okay. Uh, this we can solve efficiently, so I'm going to find the optimal solution for this, where uh, where I have these constraints. I might get something that has fractions in it. Question is, how do you round it okay, to to something that has zero one, still satisfies the constraint, and the objective value is not significantly higher? And uh, what I was saying is that the rounding we saw last time, where you try to say, oh. Uh, if x u is bigger than half, then I round up to one. Otherwise, uh, I round up, I round down to zero. Will not work in this case because, for some constraint, it could happen that I have three things, each of which is one third, and uh, those could actually. I mean, that is that satisfies the constraint. But when I round it the way we did last time, nothing is more than half. So you're not. Uh, so in the rounded solution, you will not satisfy this. So that so, so the way you kind of get around this is uh, so last time I defined this so it is uh, it's called randomized routing and the idea is essentially to interpret these exercises as probabilities. Okay. So where you say that uh, yeah think of it as probabilities. Now you set y i equals one with probability x i. So y i is now a random variable. So this is x i with probability. Sorry, it's it's one with probability x i and uh, zero other one. Okay, so y y i is always a zero one and uh, zero one solution in, in some sense. That's what we want. Ultimately, we want to come up with a zero or one solution. And so, but now this is a randomized definition. Okay, and. The question we could ask is, suppose I do this randomized procedure, I come up with some y values, right? So uh, I start with x1 through xm, I come up with y1 through yn. Okay. And as such, the, this is a 0, 1 thing, so in that sense this is a good solution. Now the question is, does this solution satisfy all the constraints? Okay, at least like with good probability. And the other thing we've got to ask is what is the expected cost of this solution? Right, so that's, uh, so those are the two things that we want to ask. Okay. So let's look at this one first, okay, because we are good at computing expected costs, right, because expectations are always, uh, we know that there's linearity of expectations, so things work out easy. So that uh, will turn out to be easy. But what is, what is the probability that the solution satisfies these constraints? So let's look at that. Yeah, the idea is just look at covering one element. Okay, so let's fix some topic i. And this would have had some gamma of i. Okay. Some gamma of i. Okay. And uh, I know that the fractional solution x satisfies mm -hmm. 
fixed u is uh, bigger than or equal to one. So why do we call this? I mean, you just have to look here, right? So this was one of the constraints. So, I mean, you had a feasible fractional solution, obviously satisfies all the constraints, right? So it satisfies this thing also. Okay, so, so it has something like this. Okay, so, so, so you know that, uh, let's, for convenience, let's call them uh, some x. Yeah, okay. Right, so, so let's call them x u1 u2 to x u k. So it's uh, x u sub 1, u sub 2, so x u k. Okay, so these are just uh, the values for those, uh, for, for those. Okay, and I know that their sum uh, is at least 1. Now when I do randomized rounding, I, got, I, I end up with these y u 1, uh, I mean, so the constraint is satisfied. If y u one plus y u two is bigger than right, because uh, I start with the x's, I randomly round each one of them. To 0 or 1, and I end up with these y's. Okay. And the constraint is satisfied if the same thing holds for the y's. So it's like saying y1 plus so on is bigger than. What does this translate to? What is actually, yeah, can you guys give me the probability that uh, probability of this event, like y1 plus y2 to yuk bigger than? Why is it 1 by 2? Uh, because I mean half the value, right? Either it is 0 or 1. Why 1? Uh, well, it wasn't half, right? So we said that uh, y is 1 with probability xi, but you're right. I mean, it's along the right track. So what you observed is that uh, the probability that these are all 0 and random variables. So you want the probability that at least one of them is 1. And so you want it's 1 minus the probability that all of them are 0. And probability that all of them are zero, uh, probability that one of these guys is zero is is one minus x i. Because with probability x i it is one, one probability one minus x i is zero. So so this the probability of this is one minus uh, the product. So that's let me write it out. 1 minus uh, x u1, 1 minus x u2, so on. Okay. Up to 1 minus x u2. Okay. So, so this whole thing is, uh, is the product. So that's the probability that the sum of the values is actually equal to 0. And because these are all 0, 1, if it's not equal to 0, it's at least 1. So, right, so, so this is now there, okay, so how do I now simplify this? <laughs> I mean, I know that sum of x u is 1, right, so now this is just some algebra that we need to do. So, how would you go about simplifying this? I've got to show that the probability that this is 1 is, is big. Because I want, uh, I mean, I want this event to happen with high probability, right? I want that the constraint has to be satisfied with high probability. So I've got to show that that probability is big, which means that I've got to show that the part in the square parentheses is small. Yeah. So how do you how would you show it? Select large number of bytes. Select what? Select large number of bytes, so you will get uh, large exponential. 
select a large of what does that mean Right, but but we don't know what the x's are, right? So the x's are whatever the solution to this linear program are, is. Okay, so so you have some solution to the linear program, but you're right. I mean, ideally, if if, the, if I mean if x's are not good enough, maybe we should probably sample with uh, make them one with probability a little bit more than x. That I agree with. But what I'm asking is, like I mean, as I wrote it, is there a way I can bound this problem? Yeah? Each of the individual terms in that expression is going to be less than 1. So it's basically a fraction. So every time we, we are going to multiply fractions, yeah. the value will keep decreasing. Okay. So something like that. Uh, right, but you've got to be more quantitative than that, right? <laughs> because, I mean, if I multiply 0 0.999 100 times, uh, to the power of 100, this is still roughly 0.9, right? So this is not that great. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you set all the x u's to be 1 over k? So you don't know what the x u's are, right? So they don't, I mean, in some sense, that's just the value of the optimal solution. Right, so, so you, you obtain the x u's by solving this linear program. So you don't know what they are, you're just given the excuse. But what I'm just saying is, you know, just given this expression, there's a way to bound it if you knew that. And you guys have all seen this in your homework, so that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> like if I told you uh, a bunch of x's, right, such that some of them, uh, let's take three of them. Okay, so, so, so I know that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is bigger than or equal to 1. Could it be that 1 minus x1 plus the times 1 minus x2 times 1 minus x3? Uh, I mean, how big can this be? Can this be really close to 1? You would guess not because at least one of them better be reasonably big and uh, probably the worst case happens when all of them are equal, something like this would be your, should be your line of thought. Okay? So, but, uh, but there's a cleaner way of doing these things. So let me just tell you. So there's only one inequality we know when we have things like this, which is that 1 minus x is less than like 3 to the minus x. Okay. So, and, and, what you, and, and this is the kind of thing you want, because then the product becomes the sum. Okay. So, so what you will do is, OK, let's use that. Okay. So then you get that this probability is now bigger than or equal to, because it's 1 minus that. Okay. So this is bigger than or equal to 1 minus e to the minus x1 plus x2, sorry, xu1 plus xu2 plus xuk. Okay. And I know that that thing is bigger than or equal to 1. So you can get that this is at least 1 minus e to the minus 1. You should check that the direction of inequality goes the right way, but you, can, you will easily be able to check that. So, so, that's, so that's that. Okay, so, so there is, uh, and this turns out to be about 63%. So there's a reasonable chance that this constraint is satisfied. So it's good, but it's not as good as we want, right? So we want like, a really good chance that each constraint is uh, is satisfied. So, so what could be a way of improving this problem? Firstly, actually, let me pause here for a bit so that you guys digest this calculation. <laughs> so, everyone, see what I've done here. I've just taken our favorite inequality and uh, just applied it there and uh, now the product becomes a summation which is nice because we have a control over the sum we know that the sum of the x u's is bigger than 1 
So I can use that inequality over here to get that this thing is uh, is bigger than one minus e to the minus one. independent rounding because that way this analysis becomes clean but uh, but if you had dependent stuff you can no longer say that this probability is 1 minus the product okay. you've got to have a different way of arguing that this probability is high okay. but that being said th so this is kind of a very well I mean this is a, a, a good area of research I mean people have there's all these dependent rounding schemes that work for this type of problems for this problem it turns out we don't need it but uh, there's more complicated problems for which you do need dependent rounding. So, that, yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, but this analysis now doesn't work because you can no longer say that this this is a product. So, is any other? Uh, you've got to be a little bit careful. If uh, c times x i is more than one, then 
you know, probability being four doesn't make sense, right? So, so you've got to be a bit careful. So you, you just say it's a min of this and one. Okay, well, that's a minor thing. So, right? So you so you have this and uh, probability otherwise. Okay, so this again is something which is a little bit different. Okay, so let's. Uh, Make uh, more okay, so boosting probability is some big constant, we will choose it appropriately. So now we are kind of in better shape, right? So we are saying, okay, so, so now I have a higher probability of success and uh, can I form, quantize this, can I make this quantitative? So I have got to go through this, right? So now what is the probability that a constraint is satisfied? Like what is probability, yeah, let me just try, what is probability of so I should be able to do the same thing, but, uh, but as I wrote it, it's a little bit messy, right? So there is this min of CXI comma one. How how do you deal with this? Cxi, then the calculation is exactly as before, right? Then you just do uh, 1 minus c times xu1, 1 minus c times xu2, so on, and everything would be simple. But if there was a 1 minus uh, Cxi that was actually, I mean, if there was a Cxi that was bigger than 1, then what can you say? Yeah, so, so c times xi, then that y is always set to 1. And right? because then we are making yi equals 1 with probability equal to 1. So that means there's nothing to check, right? So that means the probability that this is bigger than or equal to 1 is, that is equal to 1. There's uh, nothing you can, I mean, that nothing really that you need to do. So you can assume without loss of generality that all these cxi's are less than 1. Okay, because we can assume that all these CXIs are less than 1. Because otherwise this probability is 1 and there is nothing to prove. Okay. So, so that's one observation that we make. Okay, so you can assume this thing. And now the calculation proceeds as before. So this one is 1 minus 1 minus CX1 times 1 minus CX2 x, uh, oh sorry, it's u1, u2, k. And this as before is less than equal to now, it's 1 minus e to the minus c times x u1 plus x u2 to x u k, which is bigger than or equal to 1 minus e to the minus c. Okay. So earlier I, c was 1, so everything was 1 minus e to the minus 1 and so on. Now it's just C. Okay, so this is, so far it's pretty straightforward manipulation, it's exactly the same. Only extra observation was that it's, uh, that this calculation is interesting only if Cx is less than C. Okay, so that was extra. Alright, now this is looking promising, right? So this means 
that I can make the failure probability in some sense. The failure probability. That is a probability that an element is not covered. Uh, so that one can be made less than or equal to e to the minus c. Okay, for any c I want. And uh, if I listen to a suggestion and if I put, let's say, c equals 10, then it's e to the minus 10, which is like a super tiny quantity. Okay, and you hope that this actually is useful. Okay, so now let's get to what we want next. So this, uh, again, let's pause here for a bit. If there's any questions. Uh, so what we've done here is actually very simple. We've just Instead of round setting yi to be 1 with probability xi, setting it to be 1 with probability a little bit higher than xi, some constant time. And this quote is. So now I've got to see what is the probability of covering all i. So I have argued that prob of covering any given i is at least 1 minus e to the minus c. Okay. So how would you now bound the probability back to what we've learned in randomized algorithms. Also this is pretty intuitive, right? So if I have if I have a bunch of events and know that one event is successful with probability 99%, this event is successful with probability 99%, what can you say about the probability about of the like both of these happening? Sorry? That's if they are independent. Are these things independent? <laughs> yeah, actually that's a good point. So, our, uh, suppose I take I, one I and another I. Uh, you can see that if they share, uh, they share one of these experts, then they are not independent. Because that one gets rounded up or down, and uh, the same kind of like as this. Thing. Okay, so, so these eyes are not not quite independent, and yeah, that should give you a further hint. Right? So, if you if you have things that are not quite independent, what is the only method we know of arguing uh, about things like? This? So, so I'm asking something much sim uh, very simple to start with. Okay, so I have two, two events, E1. E1 occurs with probability 99%. E2 occurs with probability 99%. And I want E1 and E2. Okay. Can you say that this occurs with probability at least something? And these are not necessarily independent. Sorry? Yeah, so you've got to do some kind of a union bond, right? You just say, what is the likelihood that this thing does not happen? So if this does not happen, then one of those two does not happen. And probability that the first guy doesn't happen is 1%, probability the second guy doesn't happen is 1%. So I can, so the bond that one of those two doesn't happen is at most 2%. So this is what we said, uh, this was the union bond, right? So the probability of not E1 or not E2 is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities of not E1 and not E2, which is 2%. So, so the probability of this is at least 98%. And that's exactly what we want to use here. Right? So if uh, so I have probability of the first of I 
not being covered is at most e to the minus c. Probability of one of those things not being covered, how can you bound it? So let's give a component of this. Of uh, one, uh, like the, this one. The i is not being covered. This by union bound is at most what? This is, is it by I'm asking you to do something very similar to the right side. What I'm saying is basically property that one is not topic one is not covered or topic two is not covered or so on until or n is not covered. This is exactly what I'm asking you to bond. So so each one we have some probability and we want the probability of the R. Okay. And so what's that? Some yeah, so the failure probability of each of these guys is uh, e to the minus c. So, so this is at most n times e to the minus c. Okay. And this means the probability of covering everybody is at least 1 minus n times e to the minus c. So this is this is pretty nice. Okay, so so what this says is that uh, if I make this quantity equal to roughly whatever you want it, right, or roughly half or something, then there's at least a 50% chance that all these constraints are satisfied. And this, if you think about it, is is reasonable, right? Because we want all the constraints to be satisfied with the reasonable probability. Then I can repeat this algorithm multiple times and I already get something better. Then I have a good chance of satisfying it. So, right. So, so I, for what value of c will that be roughly half? This is now a simple calculation, right? So you want 1 minus times e minus c equals. Uh, and you realize that c has to be roughly log n. Okay, so you've got to boost this probability of selection of this of this rounding, right? The probability that y is rounded to one uh, instead of the original choice, which was just x i. I'm saying that you should boost it by a factor log n, okay. and uh, that will ensure that all the constraints are satisfied with the probability at least half. Okay. So, so that's good. So this is all, so far it was just probability of covering all the, of satisfying all the constraints. We have a second part, right, which is, uh, what is the expected number of uh, experts that you are choosing, right, the number of people you are choosing in the process. So how would you compute this? This is now straightforward. So, what is the number of people that you are choosing in the process? Okay, so, I heard uh, somebody saying it. So, some of, uh, number of people chosen is basically sum over i by i. Right? I going to 1 through n. And so, the expected value of this. This we know is just sum of our expectations. And again, these are related. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Okay. In this case, they're even independent random variables, so this is even more trivial. Here, yeah, this is true by linearity of expectation. And uh, now you, what is e of y i for a given y? Yeah. So it's uh, it's something. It's it's this right? It's min of c x i comma one, and uh, I can always say this is 
less than or equal to Cx. Okay, there's min of that and 1. And uh, that's that. And this is just C times some more I going from 1 to n. All right. So what we are saying is, in expectation, the number of people you choose is at most C times uh, the sum of this xi, i going from 1 through n. And what is the sum of xi, right? So that's, oh sorry, that is the objective value. Right? So that's the thing we were trying to minimize in the first place. And uh, we argued that this was the optimum solution for the LP. So, so what we are saying is that the expected number of people that this algorithm chooses is at most C times the objective value for this linear program. And we know that the objective value for the linear program is uh, a lower bound. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's bounded, is at most the true optimum. So we have this again a similar sandwiching type property. So we have that the expected cost of the solution produced is at most C times the opt value of the linear program. This one we know is less than or equal to the true optimum for the problem. So this is less than or equal to C times optimum value for the problem. Okay, and that's it, right? So, so then what we are saying is that in, at least in expectation, cost of the solution produced is at most C times optimum value. And, uh, and this is what we, this is all we need, essentially. Okay, so there's one small step here. I've, I've only shown things in expectation. So how would you make this, uh, I mean, is this good enough? Yeah? Then you can use the standard deviation and uh, get it down for how far, how likely you will be to like, be very far up. Yeah, so you can do the standard deviation type thing, but uh, for these kind of things, it's actually even more trivial to just use Markov's inequality. Okay. So you can just say, okay, I know that I'm always, that in expectation I'm log n, so C is log n, right? So the probability that cost of solution produced is more than 2c times, or let's say 4c times this opt value for the problem is at most one fourth. This is what Markov's inequality tells us because the expectation is at most that. And uh, so, what it means is that with probability at most one fourth, you have that, uh, the, 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 that this event happens. And the probability that this other event happens, the solution is feasible, uh, is at least one half. Okay. So, so in some sense, uh, so you will have this cost being small with probability at least three quarters. You will have all these constraints being satisfied with probability at least a half. Then again, you can use a union bond, just as we did before. So you have one event happening with. Uh, probability at least 50 percent, the other happening with 75 percent. The probability that both of them happen will be to at least with probability 25 So, let me write it. <laughs> so, 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 what we are saying is probability that number of people chosen is less than or equal to 4 times the optimum is at least 3 fourth. Okay. That's because probability that it's more than that is at most 1 fourth. So probability that this is small is uh, at least 3 fourth. 
So this is what we are saying. And then I said that probability that all constraints are satisfied <coughs> is at least a half. So the probability that both of these happen, both the above happen, is at least, so it's 1 minus that plus 1 minus this kind of a thing, so this is at least 1 fold. If both of these happen, then we are, then the algorithm is successful, right? It returned a solution whose cost is not much more than the optimal and it satisfied all the constraints. Okay? So this is very simple calculation, right? So we are just saying that, yeah, and this is when we define the algorithm as successful. It should, the solution it produces should not have too high a cost and all the constraints will be satisfied. And you just bound the probability of each of these, make sure they are close enough to one then you have a decent probability that both of these. So, so what this essentially says is that you have a, I mean, you have a good probability of success, and the solution is bound to have a cost that is roughly four times log n uh, of the optimum. Right? So, so remember it's or 4C. So, yeah. so it's 4 times log n. So this is a 4 log n approximation. To set log. Okay, so I'll pause it for a bit to see if uh, you guys have plus one fourth, which is at, at most three quarters. Okay, so the probability of the complement, which is the probability that both hold, is at least uh, one fourth. So this is exactly like this 99, two 99 percent and this 98 percent kind of a thing. It's just that in this case they are not 99, 99. One is uh, 50 percent, one is 75 percent. Okay, but it's the same logic. So that's why we have this. Okay, so, so maybe if we, if I didn't, maybe it's a little bit confusing. Maybe I should just have had the same constants in both things. So of having three quarters and half, maybe I should just have had three, four, three, four. And maybe things uh, would be clearer to people. So any other thoughts? Yeah, so this is the reason. Uh, so this is how we always uh, bound things in probabilistic algorithms where you want multiple things to happen. Okay, so like in this case, we wanted two things essentially, right? We wanted all the constraints to be satisfied and we wanted the rounded uh, objective value to be small. This thing was showing that initially we said, okay, if I set C to be log n, then the probability that all of these things happen uh, yeah, sorry, oh, all the constraints are satisfied is at least a half. And then we said, and for this we needed C equals C equals log. Okay, so this was the calculation we did a few out, out here. Okay. This ensured that with probability at least half, all the constraints are satisfied. And now, no matter what the C was, if I consider the event, what is the probability that the number of people chosen is less than 4 C times optimal? 
So because of this four essentially, you get that this probability is at least three quarter. And now the probability of both of them happening is pretty good. So this is what we usually do. If you want multiple things happening, you just want to say that this guy happens with, with probability close enough to one. This one also happens with probability close enough to one. And therefore both of those happen with reasonable probability. And uh, yeah, and having probability one fourth here is good enough because you run it four times, you know, you're bound to get, or ten times you're bound to get something that satisfies both of these with decent probability. Okay. So yeah. So what I'm saying is something pretty straightforward. So I'm sure uh, you guys will see. So I'll just uh, anyway pause for one minute and see if you have questions. <laughs> Maybe it was just a little bit fast. Ok, 
Okay, so this, uh, that's going to be here. But I wanted to talk a little bit more, since we just have 10 minutes, I want to do a very high level thing of this, of uh, using other convex relaxations. Okay, so this is something people do all the time. I mean, in fact, a lot of papers in, uh, in somewhat applied conferences are about essentially coming up with some formulation of a question, phrasing it as some optimization problem you can solve, essentially trying to use that solution to come up with this. Okay, so they, but, but the problems usually are not linear programs, they are often something more complicated. And uh, actually, yeah, so we'll see uh, one example of this, I don't think we'll get to semi-dense programming. So let's see what, what this one is. Okay. So I want to give an example of a problem where the natural relaxation of it, uh, or not quite the natural, but it turns out a useful relaxation of it is what is called an eigenvalue relaxation. So, those of you who are doing the project on spectral clustering, uh, essentially that is somewhat like this. So, but the example I want to give is what's called graph partition. Okay. So, so what's the goal here? So, you are given a big graph. Okay, so you're given a graph G, okay. and uh, so it's uh, as usual. It is undirected, unweighted, pretty simple graph, okay? So, it's undirected, unweighted. These are, uh, yeah, okay? And now, you want to find some set of vertices, S. So essentially, uh, the goal in graph partitioning is you want to break it into two pieces so that the number of edges that go across is pretty small. Okay, that's the general goal. But of course, uh, you've got to be more concrete than that because otherwise maybe there's like one, you separate one vertex from the rest of the graph. That's not quite the kind of solution you want. Okay. So one way to formally state this is to say that you want to find some set of vertices, S, so that you minimize the ratio of the edges out of S to the total possible edges out of S. Okay, what I mean by that is uh, I partition G uh, or the vertex at V into S and S complement. Okay. And what I want to minimize is this the ratio of edges going from S to S prime. So this is my notation for number of edges with one endpoint in S. S and another in S prime. Okay, so these are edges like this. Okay. Uh, divided by the total possible edges that can go between these two. Okay. So what is the total possible edges that could go between S and S prime? What's the total number of possible edges? Like how many edges of this kind can there be? Right? It's not in this graph, but uh, in any possible graph. Yeah, just think if I have two vertices here, three vertices here, how many edges can there be between them? Right? Six, right? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I see three edges here. So it's, uh, okay, so, I mean, okay, it's easy to see that this is, this quantity is size of S times size of S prime. You can have any endpoint here, any endpoint here. Okay, so that's the total possible poten all the potential edges between S and S. So you want to find an S to minimize this thing, this quantity. Okay, so this turns out to be a pretty well studied problem and uh, yeah, so any, can any of you guess why problems like this may be useful? Why you would want to solve problems like this? So it turns out one of the, I mean, I mean there are obviously some practical applications as well, but uh, even theoretically this is of interest because, I mean, you can think of doing divide and conquer like this, okay, because 
some sense you want to divide into sub problems so that there's not much interaction between the two pieces. Okay, so, so this is why people, uh, even theorists, are very interested in graph partitioning because in some sense the number of edges going across represents the interaction that you have in this graph and somehow it's, it should be small relative to the total possible amount of interaction you can have. Okay, so that's, uh, so this is, yeah, so, so, so it's useful in a lot of places. It's also useful in coming up with divide and conquer algorithms. Okay, so for instance, if you want to place a planar graph on a plane, it turns out partitioning and doing stuff like this is useful, things like this. So, anyway, so if not anything, trust me, this is a useful object. <laughs> so now, how do you find an S so that you minimize this? So, so how do you, how would you go about, suppose I asked you to write a relaxation for it. Right? So this looks a little bit different. Or write an integer program. Okay, so you, now you can come up with something. Right? So, yeah. So each uh, variable corresponds to a vertex. And it's one if it's an S and zero if it's an S. Okay, so that's excellent. So the variables are just XU, where XU is supposed to be one if it's an S, otherwise not. Okay, so now that's great. So, so we want to write E of S, S bar, divided by size of S, and the variables are. Now we can try to write this, right? So what is uh, what is the numerator? Actually, since you're kind of out of time, let me write something, and then you guys will easily be able to verify this. Okay, so it's sum over all edges i j of absolute value of x u minus x p. Right Sorry, I x i minus x j. The reason is if if I have an edge, right, so between a zero and a one, I want it to contribute one to the objective. If I have an edge between one and one, I want it to contribute zero to the objective. Okay, so those are edges uh, so this is S, this is S bar. Only such edges should be counted, right? I don't want these edges, I don't want these edges. Okay. So you can easily verify that Xi minus Xj whole square easily captures that. Okay, so this is for edges I and J. That's the numerator. And denominator, there's many ways of writing it. So the trivial way of writing the denominator is uh, sum over i x i times n minus sum over i x i. Okay, so you could do that. You could do squares. You can do whatever you want, right? So, so this, uh, so this is one way of writing this. That's a little more tricky way of writing the denominator is. Sum over all pairs ij of xi minus xj goes. Okay. So this is a little bit more tricky way of writing this. The reason they are the same is because remember the formulation, right? I'm saying it, it is the fraction of edges going out to the total possible edges. Okay. So I kind of want to stick to that. And if I have uh, some S and S prime, you can easily verify that this is essentially the total possible edges that could go from S to S prime. S complement. Okay, so that's that. Okay. So now you can say that what I want to minimize is sum over edges ij of this quantity 
divided by sum over all pairs ij of xn and 6j also. And this, uh, uh, I mean, now it's, it's a clean thing, right? So xi uh, is uh, 0, 1. Okay. So this is one way to formalize this. And now, if I just, uh, I mean, this of course can't be solved because this is some bit, uh, something in 0, 1. Now if I just relax these constraints and I just say min over all x, okay, these are just real numbers of sum over adjacent i j that's written like this sometimes, i adjacent to j x i minus x j plus square divided by sum over all pairs. So it turns out this is an eigenvalue problem. Okay, so I, if I had a little more, five more minutes, I would have shown you why this is an eigenvalue problem. But it turns out this is. Okay, so this, uh, yeah, it's very cleanly an eigenvalue problem. Okay. And this you can solve. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, you can find the best possible x's, but it will give you some arbitrary real numbers, which could be any, anywhere. Okay. And the question is now, how do you go from that to an actual solution to this? And uh, it turns out there's a very clean algorithm for this, where you think of these x's as being on a line, so these are arbitrary real numbers, so there'll be something. Okay, and now you try to find some uh, partition of the real line. And you put everything on this side to 1 and everything on this side to 0. <laughs> okay. And uh, this turns out to give a decent approximation to the original thing. Okay. So this is, uh, this is one of the very popular ways of partitioning graphs. You first solve this eigenvalue problem because people in numerical analysis have really found ways to do this very fast. And then, uh, and then you try to uh, do this. It's called, a play, it's called a line sweep type algorithm. So you try to do this uh, and you see which cut gives the good, good approach. Okay. So there's, yeah, there's guarantees for this and yeah, it's a deep theorem in math. Okay. So anyway, so let's stop here. And uh, but the point I want to make is that nothing very special about linear programs. Okay. So, so yeah, we'll end here. Next time we we'll start something new.